Hello, and welcome to today's Cybersecurity Summit Power Hour. My name is Rick. I will be in the background answering any WebEx technical questions. We have a few housekeeping items before we get started. If you are experiencing any technical difficulties joining the WebEx session, please submit a question using the Q&A panel. During the presentation, all participants will remain in listen-only mode. And as a reminder, this event is being recorded for rebroadcast. We will be holding a Q&A session at the conclusion of each of today's presentations. We encourage you to submit written questions at any time during the presentation using the Q&A panel at the bottom right of your screen. Please type your questions into the text field and hit send. Please keep the dropdown as all panelists. With that, we invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy today's presentation. I would now like to introduce Bradford Rand, CEO of the Cybersecurity Summit. Bradford, we have the floor. Great. Thank you, Rick. Uh, and thank you all for joining us today at our New York Power Hour. Uh, this is really for the entire Northeast region. And we've got some wonderful expert speakers that are uh, going to be joining us today. So as Rick said, uh, sit back, relax, take some notes. We are going to make all of the slides available to you approximately two days after the summit. And those are going to be on Cyber Summit USA. So if you need that as a reference, feel free to visit, uh, visit back with us and check those notes. Uh, additionally, if you join us for the entire day, you will earn a CPE credit and uh, our team will email that to you also within about two or three days, we'll get a certificate. And most importantly, we do look forward to seeing you uh, hopefully in six months when the Cyber Summit goes live again uh, with our live events. Up until that time, we are gonna be hosting our Cybersecurity Summit series all throughout the country on a virtual platform. So hopefully we will see you then. And without further delay, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Fred Sanks. He's been with the US Secret Service for a few years right now, and he's gonna kick us off with our security debriefing. Again, be sure in the Q&A box right on your screen there, if you've got any questions, uh, certainly hit us up and we'll try to address as many as we can. Thank you so much. And uh, Fred, go ahead and take it away. Thank you, sir. Um, good morning, my name is Fred Sanks. I'm a network intrusion forensic analyst for the United States Secret Service. I'm currently the forensic lab director for the Boston Field Office of the Secret Service and I deal with network intrusion responses and digital forensic examinations with, within the New England area. Um, this morning, I'll be providing some basic information about some of the major cyber threats being dealt with on a daily basis, and I will, will also be speaking about some ways to help prevent these cyber threats. In addition, I'll be discussing how some of these cyber attacks have been transformed to utilize the COVID-19 pandemic that we are currently facing to enhance the success of the attacks. The first area of commonly seen cyber attacks that I will be discussing is known as business email compromise or BC. A business email compromise is a type of scam targeting companies who conduct wire transfers. Corporate or publicly available email accounts of individuals working in areas such as finance, accounting, and procurement or somehow involved with wire transfer payments are either spoofed or compromised through several vectors such as malware and phishing attacks to do fraudulent transfers, resulting in hundreds of thousands of dollars in losses. The FBI reported in 2019 BEC attacks led to approximately $1.7 billion in losses for companies globally with an average of $75,000 lost in each attack. The first vector of BEC compromise I wanna discuss is called phishing. Phishing is any attempt to trick victims into sharing sensitive information such as passwords, usernames, and credit card details for malicious reasons. The attackers often disguise themselves as a trustworthy entity or, um, and make contact with the target via email, social media, phone calls, and even text messages. Phishing is not a personalized attack and is usually sent to the masses at the same time. The goal of phishing attacks is to send a spooked email or other communication that looks as if it is from an authentic organization to a large number of people, banking on the chances that someone will click on the phishing link planted within the communication and prov provide their, or provide their personal information or download malware. Spear phishing attacks, on the other hand, are targeted attempts to steal sensitive information such as account credentials or financial information from a specific victim. This is usually achieved by acquiring personal de details of the victim, such as the, their friends, hometown, employer, locations they frequent, and what uh, they have recently bought online. 
The attackers then typically disguise themselves as a trustworthy friend or entity to acquire sensitive information, typically through email or other online messaging. This is one of the most successful forms of acquiring confidential information on the internet. And Simon Tech reported in 2019, they found that 65% of targeted attacks started with a spear phishing email. Now the phishing links within these communications typically connect to either a fraudulently branded site to coincide with the email, which asks for to fill uh, in PII, such as name, birth date, address, and social security number, or it may ask for login credentials on a spoof site branded to look like the email or business site you thought you were going to when you clicked on the link. Also, it can directly link to a malware infected website which can install malicious software if your machine or a software on your machine is vulnerable to whatever particular vulnerability is being exploited by the malware you unknowingly downloaded when you clicked on the link. Now, the malicious software that is unknowingly installed on a business's computer system can, among other things, steal sensitive information, alter or hijack a computer system or plant ransomware. I wanna note that the phishing links used for BEC attacks are often going to link to a spoof site that looks like your email login so that you input, input your email username and password, which is then sent to the attacker so he can log into your account. If the link is used to download malware, then it could be some kind of key logger which logs everything you type, or it could be a malware such as a, a remote access trojan or backdoor trojan that allows the attacker to remotely log into your system to access your email client. The bottom line is that the attacker wants access to your email account so that they can successfully conduct their business email compromise. Another vector used to gain access either to your computer or email client is known as brute force password attacks. This type of attack tries various combinations of usernames and passwords again and again until it gets your correct login password. This repetitive action is like an army attacking a fort. Oftentimes, oftentimes attackers use a method known as brute force credential stuffing to obtain login credentials. And credential stuffing is basically using billions of login credentials shared between hackers, as well as those posted publicly from previous data breaches of other websites in an automated tool that typically utilizes proxies. Proxies are basically computers or applications that serve as a hub for internet requests that distribute all the requests across different IP addresses. The whole point of the use of proxies is to help anonymize the attacker so he or she can't be easily identified. And on that topic, attackers use often VPN servers to encrypt all network traffic and further anonymize their identity. Once the attacker uses one of the methods discussed to compromise an email account, they typically log into that email account and search for conversations about money being transferred through a wire transaction. More specifically, they look for conversations that emphasize discussions involving billing and payment information internally between two or more parties. At that point, the attacker typically intercepts that conversation. So once an email chain involving a wire transfer that will take place is located, the attacker has several methods of engaging this email chain to try to get the wire transfer to be sent to the attacker's bank account. One of the common methods I've seen involves setting up email forwarding rules in a compromised email account so that copies of emails of interest are forwarded to the attacker's email automatically without being seen by the victim, often because the original email of interest is not sent to the inbox but another folder such as the draft folder, for example. In many cases, the original emails are even deleted from the victim's mailbox completely. Then the attacker sometimes creates a domain that is very similar to the victim's domain and mimics all the details of the victim's outgoing emails to intercept the money wire email chain. In other cases, the attacker may not even bother creating a domain and just continues to log into the victim's email account to send and receive communications. The attacker may also be looking for <clears throat> for emails that involve attachments so that the attacker can then attach malware to infect the other party in the email chain that has not yet been compromised. I've seen this done often through a Word document with a malware dropper macro that is attached. This Word document usually also contains the new wire transfer instructions for the attacker's bank account information. An example of this was a case I investigated involving a medium-sized business that initially was compromised through a fake Microsoft update email with an attachment for a fake office update. The email was sent to the person in charge of payments for the business, and she attempted to use the link to update her Microsoft Office application. The link installed malware on the system that allowed the attacker to gain access to the finance director's computer. This malware was running in an area of the computer called memory that is typically hard to detect. The attacker gained access to the computer, which automatically had access to the finance director's Microsoft Outlook application. The finance director did not log out of her account when she left every day, and the attacker waited until after business hours to remotely access the computer 
and change the victim's email forwarding rules so that all emails related to a specific business that the victim was conducting wire transfer transfers with would be forwarded to the attacker's email. In addition, the original email was automatically transferred to the save folder and flagged as old mail so that the victim would not see the emails without physically going into the save folder. The attacker then purchased the domain name that was almost the same as the businesses. So let's pretend this business, for argument's sake, was www.goodbusiness.com. The attacker purchased the domain name very similar like www.g00dbusiness.com with two zeros instead of O's in the word good. This is done so that the email address the attacker uses looks almost exactly the same as the victim's in the hopes that the new target, in hopes that the target does not notice the this, this small difference. The attacker then monitored the victim's email account and waited for the perfect opportunity to send an email from his fraudulent email address that looked just like the email that would come from the victim, including fonts used and even business lo logos used in the uh, victim business email. The email asked for a change in banking information for an upcoming wire transfer that was going to be made to the business in the amount of $500,000. Unfortunately, the target business did not recognize that this was a scam and did not initially call the initially compromised business to confirm the new banking information given. As a result, the victim business lost $500,000 and our agency was not notified with enough time to freeze the wire transfer before it went overseas. So now that you know the basics of an email compromise, and how it's conducted, I want to provide you with some ways to help prevent these attacks. First of all, do not click on any links and emails from unknown sources. Um, second, look at the finer details of emails for things such as misspelled words, the email addresses listed in the to and from columns being correct, and broken English being used in the email. These are telltale signs that the email could be fraudulent. Also confirm the domain is correct and hover over any graphics attached to the email to see if there's a URL attached to the graphic, but make sure you don't click on any of the graphics. Um, keep your antivirus up to date. Um, if your company uses cloud email, please ensure that logging is turned on and that your logs are saved regularly because Microsoft and other cloud providers have short retention uh, periods of approximately 90 days on average. And I want to stress that point because oftentimes the BEC cases, logs provide the most robust source of forensic data that we have. I would also suggest enabling two-factor authentication for logging into your computer user account and email account whenever possible, especially for cloud email accounts. Also, you need to have good passwords that are at least 12 characters with special characters, capitals, and numbers. The latest advice I have heard is to use a phrase and take the first letter of every word in the phrase and add numbers, special characters, and symbols for complexity. Next, force all employees to change all passwords at least monthly. Um, in addition, make it a practice to check email forwarding rules and settings regularly and have IT patch all potential software and computer vulnerabilities as soon as they are discovered. The next type of cyber attack seen commonly that I want to discuss is known as ransomware. Ransomware is defined by term macro, macro, micro as a type of malware that prevents or limits users from accessing their system either by locking the system screen or by locking the user's files unless a ransom is paid. More modern ransomware families collectively categorize as crypto ransomware, encrypt certain file types on infected systems and force users to pay the ransom, often through the use of cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin to get a decryption key. In many cases, victims have paid the ransom and the decryption keys were not even sent to them or they didn't work. One of the vectors used to implement this attack is phishing or spear phishing, which I discussed earlier. The only difference is that the link in the emails or other communication methods used by the attacker have a link that goes to malicious software that downloads and activates a type of malware that allows the attackers to conduct reconnaissance on the entire network and then ultimately encrypt all or most of the uh, computers on the network. Another vector com commonly used for an attack is brute forcing a victim's remote access password to gain access to the victim's system. Attacker use, attackers use sites like Shodan.io, which is a search engine for internet connected devices, to find devices with open Windows RDP or remote desktop protocol ports, which are open. Attackers then attempt to directly connect with IP addresses identified and use brute forcing or credential stuffing attacks that we discussed earlier to obtain user credentials to remotely log in to the victim's computer and manually install ransomware on the victim's system. Attackers will also search for other remote software such as TeamViewer and Screen Connect being used on a system to exploit in order to basically gain remote access in that way. 
One of the vectors used in this attack that has not been previously discussed is known as vendor network compromise. Attackers often find the weakest link is a third party vendor, such as an electronic billing or payroll service that has access to your system and sensitive information. A company may have great network security practices and protocols, but they do not necessarily control how the third party vendors behave. I uh, have personally seen many third party vendors that use bad security practices, such as default passwords to remotely log into uh, uh, client systems. The attackers love this because if they're trying to get the biggest bang for their buck, so to speak, then they will, then if they compromise the third party vendor, then they may potentially have access to all clients that the vendor services. The attacker may use one of the initial attack vectors I spoke about earlier. And once they gain access to the third party vendor, then they can potentially just remotely go into the systems of all its clients and drop ransomware on all their systems, depending on what type of access has been given to that third party vendor. Another vector we haven't discussed previously are malicious websites or malicious website advertisements. Sometimes attackers like to attack websites and once they have gained access to the website, then they drop malware that allows the attacker to alter the website by adding additional malware that may automatically download itself onto a computer or a victim visiting the website. The attacker often uses exploit kits that hide and scan the computers of website visitors for outdated software and vulnerabilities the visitor's computer may contain. Bad actors can also hijack ads on websites or purchase advertisement space from an ad company to post a malicious ad onto many well-known and reputable websites as well. These malicious ads are also designed to place ransomware such as the Soden Kibi ransomware, for example, on vulnerable computers if a vulnerability is detected. The malicious ads can also link to the ransomware so that if they are clicked, then the victim is taken to a spoof site that downloads ransomware onto their system. With ransomware, I have a few recommendations to help prevent this type of attack as well. First of all, backup data rec regularly. Data restores are the best way to overcome a ransom ransomware attack. In addition, make several backup copies and keep one of the these copies off-site and unconnected to the network. Having a copy off-site will also protect your data loss in the event of a fire or flood in a server room. Also, Enable logging in your firewalls, proxies, via VPN server, and other devices. This will help you and law enforcement partners determine the path of an attack, so retain as many logs as possible. I can't stress that enough. With regards to phishing attacks, I recommend the same suggestions as I did earlier. Um, in addition, if remote access to your systems are a necessity, then put access to your system behind a VPN or very private network so it's not directly accessible. These systems should not be open to the internet. Additionally, systems requiring remote access should sit behind a terminal server or jump box. The jump box should also sit behind a VPN, be configured to a limited number of admins, and remote users should be given the least amount of privileges to the jump box and the systems they are remoting into. Also, you could use a remote desktop gateway server, which will give you additional security like two-factor authentication while remoting, remotely logging into your systems. Um, also, you want to vet your vendors to confirm that they are security conscious, including looking at the vendor's comprehensive security policies to see if they regularly perform data backups, regularly perform internal security audits, and if they perform background checks on the employees that access your data. Also, you may want to have your IT managers and compliance teams pay vendors a physical visit and do a site visit with the vendor's operational team that handles your business's sensitive data. Another suggestion is to know what sensitive data is on your systems and who has access to it at all times. Limit access to websites that are not needed for business. In addition, enable always on VPN. Since most companies are allowing remote work, this forces employees to always be connected to the com company's network um, following the company's security posture and, and uh, policies. Lastly, disable uh, local administrator access for all normal users. This is one of the main reasons why attackers can move so freely within the environment. So there was an, a hacker we actually arrested who advised that hardening systems, especially for users, is the most effective deterrent for, for uh, attackers. <clears throat> the next thing I want to speak on briefly is how attackers are using common attacks like the ones I spoke about while leveraging current events such as the COVID-19 pandemic. One of the enhancements seen with regards to malicious emails 
Is the use of fear of COVID-19 to orchestrate emails with attachments that are most likely to be clicked on because people are nervous and want answers about what's going on right now? An example of this are phishing emails sent out that claim to have a cure or new testing method for COVID-19. These emails are like any other phishing email, but use the topic of COVID-19 cure and testing because of everyone's current concern with the matter. Also, due to the fact that everyone is at home, remote desktop clients are at an all-time high, and many companies that have not previously used these types of platforms are sometimes using unsafe practices which are being exploited by the bad actors. With regards to the use of uh, wire transfer fraud, there are a few specific trends being seen. The first fraud largely being implemented right now is the COVID-19 unemployment fraud scheme. Um, basically, bad actors are either purchasing people's PII on the dark web or physically exploiting websites and business servers to gain this information. The bad actors are then using the PII to apply for unemployment benefits in the victim's name. The bad actors seem to be targeting victims who they believe uh, are still employed, such as government employees and many large businesses, uh, members of large businesses. Um, they target these groups so that they have a better chance of applying under a victim's name that has not already applied for unemployment benefits. Another scheme being seen involves stimulus money is being given out by the government during these trying times. Many bad actors are sending out spam emails and communications and asking for a fee so that the victim will get their stimulus money sooner. Um, this is an obvious scam that many desperate victims have fallen for, unfortunately, and the victim uh, pays for the fee, asked, but they don't receive their uh, payments any earlier, of course. Um, the last scam I wanna talk about uh, involves the belief that the victim is investing in a business that has found a cure to COVID-19. The bad actor, again, sends out spam emails or other communications that purport that a detection method or cure is found, and then investing in the company will be very rewarding for the victim. Unfortunately, this too has been quite successful to several unknowing victims. I know that was a lot of information given in a short period of time, but my intent was to give you as much information as I could with the time given. I hope my presentation was insightful and helpful to you in some way. If you have any cyber-related attacks or fraudulent crimes, with regards to your business, I would hope that you would contact the Secret Service or other law enforcement entity to help. I've included in this slide the contact information for several Secret Service offices within the New York metro region, as well as the website for all Secret Service offices. In addition, I listed the website for additional information on cyber attacks provided by the Department of Homeland Security, and also the websites for Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, or CISA, that helps build the national capacity to defend against uh, cyber attacks by working hand in hand with public and private sectors to strengthen national se security as a whole. I'm sure Mr. Ford from CISA will speak on that more. I appreciate your time and welcome any questions you may have. Okay, thank you so much. I think uh, you made up for a lot of lost time. Do appreciate that. Uh, we've got a great question here. In terms of ransomware, do you think it's better to have a strict policy on not negotiating with the hackers in terms of sending money? or satisfying the request, or would it be more situationally uh, based? I think it, it would be situationally based. I mean, uh, the Secret Service doesn't condone, uh, you know, paying any ransom at all. That's, that's not our policy and that's not what we condone as, a, as an agency. But I, I understand that some businesses uh, are weighing the cost of making the payment over how long it will take to get up and how much that's gonna cost them. And I'm, I'm not in any position to tell a business what they, they should do. Um, but I will say that there have been many times where you pay and you, like I said, you do not get um, the decryption key or it's a bad key, or you pay, you get your stuff decrypted, a couple of days later they get back on your network and they do the same thing because they know you're going to pay. So uh, that's my thoughts on that uh, question. Sure. Uh, that's great. I think uh, probably the most at risk is usually like a hospital, you know, when someone threatens to turn off all of the heart machines, you know, what do you do, you know? Definitely exactly. a tough situation there. Uh, with regards to passwords, changing passwords, uh, changing them monthly, is that no longer considered a best practices? Well, you know, what, is your, what are your thoughts on uh, password changes uh, and the timing of password changes? I, I would say at a minimum monthly. I mean, if you want to be even more secure and do weekly or bi-weekly, that's up to your business, and, and, and I would say that that's going to make you a, a little more responsible uh, as far as security. But, uh, yeah, as far as I heard, monthly is, is, is uh, the practice that's being, uh, that's being suggested. 
And there are there are protocols and tools out there that actually help you manage those passwords uh, uh, quite a bit out there. Um, with regards to, <clears throat> uh, we have another one that just came in. <clears throat> I guess uh, for recent events, has there been any uh, Antifa cyber attacks been detected? You know, with this George uh, Floyd case, anything coming from stemming from that? Uh. I can't speak on personal knowledge of any of that. I'm sure there are. I, I don't have any personal knowledge of if there are any that uh, that are going on within the service because I'm not aware of any in, in what I'm doing in my role. Gotcha. Okay. Well, that about uh, wraps us up. Thank you so much for sharing all of that information and including the contact uh, information, Fred, uh, from all of the offices. Um, as I've said to uh, the nearly 400 people that are with us, we are going to be sharing uh, the slide deck with all of you, so you will be able to contact the Secret Service or the other agencies uh, if you are in the case of a breach. Uh, Fred, thank you so much again. I apologize again to all the participants. We did have that audio problem, but obviously that's been rectified. And again, thank you so much for your service, Fred, to our country. And stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you, sir. Thanks for having me. Oh, absolutely. And we are going to bring up um, our next. Howdy. Good morning to yourself and to everyone out there in TV land. Um, I guess I'll uh, kick on the video because uh, I do have a face for radio, I guess. So, um, hi, I'm uh, Dr. Russ Handorf. Uh, I recently joined uh, White Ops this last November after working for the FBI Cyber Division headquarters for 10 years. Before that, I was uh, an InfoSec career individual for financial services industry sort of stuff and i'm joined today with one of my colleagues mike and mike if you'll there you go thanks russ uh yeah hey everybody mike terry here i've been with white ups for two years i'm a product manager uh previously i've worked at pound here as a big data uh engineer and then before that uh cool stuff with radios and aviation and agriculture uh, thanks russ sure and uh we're we're happy and excited to join uh, everyone and talk to you all about who we are and what we're doing and some of the fun things uh, that are out there on the interwebs. And one of the reasons why I joined White Ops from um, the FBI was their their mission to disrupt the economics of cybercrime resonated with me very hard and strong. And the, the approaches that we take uh, with the products and solutions that we've developed in order to do so was inspiring to me and uh, uh, very, very cool. But the just in the short time that I've been here, I've also seen the uh, the growth of the organization and the sense of what we stop and what we measure. Like when I first started back in November, we were processing about a trillion unique events a week, and now we're up to, I believe it's about five and growing. Uh, or, yeah, so it, it's a lot of data. And uh, uh, it's, it's it's really neat to be able to see how all of the various components are stitched together in order to go in and um, uh, prevent various forms of cyber attacks uh, that we'll be talking about today. So, uh, yep, that's us. Um, and the fundamental mission of the organization is to disrupt the economics of cybercrime through uh, the technology solutions that we implement. And uh, what I had previously done uh, at the FBI, uh, I've kind of had a bit of a career in combating cybercrime and the marriage of that with White Ops was uh, fantastic. But the from the federal government's perspective, uh, there's a lot of different agencies that have their fingers in this pot and then this mission. And then because of that, they have multiple different strategies and they seem to go a lot of different directions. Uh, but fundamentally also at the same time to uh, add to some complexity to the challenge uh, that was faced back then in my life was everyone's kind of scattered and going a lot of different directions, but also at the same time, we all while we all use the same prosecutors, there's they interpret uh, laws very uniquely in approximately about 11 different ways because there's 11 different federal court districts uh, districts across the U.S. So that added an additional challenge. So what would be prosecuted in the Eastern District of New York would be completely and wildly interpreted differently on the West Coast. And that while that is uh, uh, fine from the construct of the justice system, 
it makes uh, working those sort of violations that much more difficult because the, I, I personally believe the internet has made the world flat again. So there's a lot of inconsistency. And where I personally, you know, I'm slightly biased because I work for the FBI, but I believe one particular component uh, of the giant mission of the federal government in this space where they got it right was in the cyber action team. And what the cyber action team um, is, is their uh, rapid deployment team to anywhere in the world within about 72 hours. Uh, they bring to the table very sophisticated tools and investigative technique, uh, techniques in order to move the investigations forward. Uh, the individuals who are selected to be on the team are highly trained uh, and highly skilled in this uh, specific space. They are not the normal run-of-the-mill folks. I'm getting some feedback. Um, and then the other major component, which I also enjoyed, was uh, the light touch. In other words, you probably would never even feel our presence there, but the impact of the presence was always very high. And that is a core construct of what I like to see, especially with the wide ops capabilities and solutions uh, that we bring in. So one thing I definitely want to get out of the gate is uh, hackers good, criminals bad. Um, there's this construct of the, uh, well, there's a lexicon construct associated with like hackers are bad. Uh, hackers are not bad. Actually, I would argue that everyone in this call is a hacker in one way or another. Uh, when they hackers break the law, they're now criminals, uh, much like we don't have a different name for other types of, you know, fields when they break the law, they're all criminals. <laughs> so uh, from our construct, we, we bring the hacker mentality and methodology to the table when we take a look at the data uh, and develop the tools and techniques uh, to study the adversaries that are out there and uh, cause uh, positive impacts for the internet. So a couple of ways that I've come to understand how criminals hide on the internet uh, is uh, first they gotta have in, uh, infrastructure and the most popular form of infrastructure that's out there is bulletproof hosting providers. And the image that you see is from uh, the Ukrainian SBU uh, from uh, a search warrant that they conducted of a bulletproof hosting provider in Ukraine. It was, uh, they have a YouTube video uh, of the search warrant of the facility. It's got like James Bond style hiding mechanisms associated with it, like a false floor elevator uh, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, the construct of a bulletproof hosting provider is a data center where criminals can hide their stuff that does not respond to law enforcement requests and are difficult to find in meat space. So these people projected their internet presence around the world, but we're all in one location. Another part of the big infrastructure is uh, hijacked equipment and uh, uh, edge devices like routers or uh, any forms of customer premise equipment or um, you know your infrastructure is their infrastructure. Uh, like a common uh, joke is like uh, your computer is my computer or something along those lines. Uh, that is the next most common piece of infrastructure because that's quickly scalable uh, and does not require a lot of uh, money to be exchanged, uh, which leads a trail of evidence. And then the last one is leased infrastructure uh, where they actually do rent out uh, services and various big cloud providers uh, in order to add legitimacy to their presence on the internet. And that's something that we see as well. One of the ways that uh, I, I work within the threat intel team uh, for White Ops, and one of the things that we do uh, in order to study the adversaries is a platform that we call Malquarium. And uh, Malquarium is a framework uh, for providing collection analysis and deception operations uh, that we conduct against uh, the adversaries that we are chasing uh, that then turn into uh, you know markers and data results that feed into the defense uh, and other components of uh, the systems and solutions at wide ops uh, the the uh, fundamental functionality of it uh, allows us uh, to safely detonate uh, malware in long-term environments and not just like study it for five minutes we run malware for weeks to months on end in order to see as well, like when we take our, an action against a botnet, we can see this node change its behavior as well. So that provides us valuable insight as to the human, the criminal on the other end, uh, making these changes. So it helps us uh, 
rapidly test and scale uh, uh, and collect and analyze uh, malware samples of various forms and factors. And uh, the impact that we've had uh, thus far uh, is pr uh, produced I think we uh, at this point we have like a new threat intel product that pops uh, gets pushed out every week about another big botnet or another huge investigation uh, about various forms of malware families uh, for anyone who wants to read about them uh, the link to it uh, is at the bottom uh, of this slide but it's really uh, incredible to see all these huge big nasty things that are infected on the internet uh, get uh, dismantled and uh, seeing the huge real-time results of that dismantlement. And another point that I would like uh, uh, that we take from a philosophical perspective that I also had in, uh, uh, from my law enforcement career is that criminal process isn't always the right solution. Uh, sometimes the economics of the situations in which the people from their local economies they were drawn to cybercrime because uh, they fundamentally need to put bread on the table. So if there's a, you know, a keep it human sort of aspect to uh, how we work, and if I can convert, like help someone get a legitimate job who was previously a criminal and now bring them to the other side of the table, that's now one less malware author on the internet and someone else who's joined the fight for us. So that's, that's another construct that we have uh, as we operate. So I'll kick it off to Mike. Thanks, Russ. Um, again, uh, Mike Terry here, product manager. So uh, I'm going to talk about, you know, how do we productize, uh, you know, the capabilities of the very smart people like Russ that we have and these hackers. Uh, you know, we're dealing with adversaries on the other side, and uh, we're dealing with pretty specific threat models. Uh, in particular, you know, when Russ showed us those bulletproof servers or our adversaries are using botnets or residential proxies. Uh, a lot of times what we're trying to do is detect and mitigate bot traffic uh, because these adversaries are using these bots uh, for a variety of threat models, things like account takeover. You know, if, if, a, if a hacker is running a credential stuff in attack and pops a few bank accounts, that's thousands of dollars, if not more. Um, and then there's a variety of other threat models, things like new account fraud, which that can be used to manipulate a platform. Uh, of course, we're familiar with content manipulation. Uh, there's payment fraud, ticketing fraud, um, and, and other threat models uh, that we're trying out there to essentially use the capabilities of our hackers and protect our clients. Uh, and so I'll talk about how we do that uh, and how we productize that and automate it. So uh, something that's really in the DNA of the company, and also I think a lot of folks here are familiar with, and this applies really well to cybersecurity, is uh, John Boyd's OODA loop. Uh, John Boyd was a colonel in the Air Force, uh, a fighter pilot and a military strategist. And he uh, developed this framework uh, for dealing with adversaries. Um, and, it's, and it applies in cybersecurity. Uh, we have, you know, we're observing uh, the thing that's happening. Uh, we're trying to orient and figure out what, what, what's going on. And then uh, we make a decision on that. Uh, is it a bot or is it a human? And then finally, you actually want to mitigate or act on that traffic. Uh, so, in the parlance of white ops, um, what our R&D team works on, uh, the hackers, the threat intel folks, um, they work on these various slices of, of this framework uh, so that we can protect our customers against the variety of threat models. Uh, so starting on, on the observation side, uh, we have what are called signals. We're, we're interrogating the environment uh, where the interaction is coming from, where the request is coming from. Uh, so for example, um, a user is logging in on a, on a bank uh, login page. Uh, we are running JavaScript there, collecting signal, and trying to figure out if is that uh, traffic bot or not. Uh, so the signals then flow into markers. And again, our R&D team will say, OK, if these set of signals exist, then we have this marker that's going to identify the traffic as a bot, for example. Um, you know, a simple signal might be the mouse movement is moving at 90 degree angles. Well, human can't do that, but a, an automated uh, uh, bot surely can. A another good example is, for example, if, if the browser is telling us that it's Firefox on Windows, but another signal tells us that it's Linux, well, those two things can't exist. And, and that's another market that's going to tell us, hey, th this is a, uh, automated traffic, uh, maybe malware-driven traffic, uh, or, or something funny is going on. 
Um, and then finally, th those markers, once triggered, flow into a decision. Uh, we make a decision on that traffic. Uh, we classify it. Is it a bot? Is it non-standard? Perhaps things like uh, a proxy, VPN, anonymous browsing, things that might be interesting about the traffic. And then finally, we get to the action step or the mitigation. Uh, do we allow the traffic through? Do we block it? Uh, how do we deal? You know, sometimes we might want to deceive the adversary, let them through, make them think they're succeeding, and then drop the floor from under them. Uh, and then, of course, there's these feedback loops that are that are very important. We, we want to see how the adversary uh, interfaces after the fact. And we also run into this issue where we don't want to end up uh, as an oracle for the adversaries, letting them know that we're catching them. Surely with simple bots, that's okay, but with the more sophisticated stuff, uh, you really got to be careful with how much information you're uh, giving to the adversary. Um, you know, a little bit more on the R&D side, kind of how the detection layer, you know, that signal and marker layer uh, we work. Uh, there's four primary components. We have the technical evidence approach, which is uh, probably what differentiates us from other bot mitigation platforms out there in the market. Um, Technical evidence means that we're interrogating the environment where the traffic is coming from. So whether it's the mobile in-app, uh, native app that's generating the traffic, or a browser. Uh, if it's a browser, we're running JavaScript. If it's mobile, we have an SDK. We're running mini touring tests on those environments. We're collecting a bunch of signal, and we're getting uh, definitive evidence uh, that whether that traffic is legitimate or not. Uh, so that's technical evidence we're looking for, uh, evidence that traffic might be bought. Then we have the global threat intel team, which is the team that Russ is on. So this is the proactive arm where they're looking for what kind of techniques are the adversaries using out there? Uh, what kind of tools are they using? What kind of uh, you know, deception uh, browsing are they implementing so that we can get ahead of it proactively, implement the signals and markers so that once they come to our customers' platforms, we're already ahead of them and catching those bots. Uh, then we have machine learning, uh, and this is commonly what a lot of uh, bot mitigation solutions or edge service providers rely on is this anomaly-based technique or machine learning. Uh, it's certainly part of the detection uh, approach. It, it is a layer there, but alone it, it's not enough, which is why you need the technical evidence, the global threat intel. Um, but of course, again, the machine learning is really good. You know, we see an anomaly, for example, uh, a specific IP address is hitting a server. Well, clearly that's nefarious. And we should be uh, and then finally, continuous adaptation. And this is where we have those feedback loops. It's not enough to catch the adversary at step one when they uh, hit customer servers initially. It's all about how are they going to adapt and how are they going to change and are we going to catch them at that second step. And, and that's where we require that proactive uh, research, not just having one marker, one signal to catch the adversary, but having an array. So even if they get around one marker or signal, they, they're still uh, you know, about a dozen other markers that are triggering and, and they don't know how we're catching them. Uh, so that's really core to our detection approach. Uh, so now, you know, as far as the product, and I talked a little bit about this, th this is the, the mitigation platform. Uh, we start on the lower left-hand side with the client. This is, again, where the JavaScript or SDK runs. This is where we're collecting that evidence. That signal flows to our decision engine. Um, this is where our markers get triggered, uh, where we're able to decide on the traffic depending on how it was configured. Perhaps a customer has a whitelist. Uh, we classify the event as bot, um, bot meaning we have evidence of compromise, we have evidence of automation, uh, or we classify it as non-standard. Perhaps it's a VPN or proxy, or Russ and his team, uh, you know, has uh, has a gray list of, of IP addresses or devices that they'd have identified uh, from a botnet that's spread out. Maybe there's a, you know, a million IPs that are at risk. It could be a human, but at the same time, the same device has malware on it. Uh, and you know, it's a higher risk profile that we should service our customers and let them know. Uh, and then once we make that decision and classify that traffic, that event, uh, we get to the mitigation step. Um, and this is where our customers are integrated in a service server fashion. They say, hey, White Ops, uh, can you tell us if this login attempt is a bot or not? Should we block it? Should we allow it? Um, and, and then they, we act on that traffic. Um, it could be service server or proxy where we're actually in the driver's seat blocking that traffic on their behalf. And, and of course, there's you know, customization there that, that can be done. And, and the responses vary. Uh, you know, we, we can allow the traffic, we can block it, uh, we can time out, keep the connection open. 
uh, or in the really advanced cases, uh, deception, uh, which is probably the most exciting uh, just because uh, you make the adversary think they're succeeding and then the floor drops from under them and they don't know where they fail. They've invested all these resources and then the ROI goes down. That's ultimately how you beat these guys. Um, I'll show you a quick demo. So I'll share my screen uh, just so this is a little bit more real for you guys. Uh, so on the left-hand side, I have a sample login page. Imagine an adversary is going to run a credential stuffing attack. You know, they have 2 million usernames and passwords, and they're going to automate uh, some sort of bot. You can see uh, in terms of integration, here we have the JavaScript tag. It's one line of code that, you know, our customer would implement. This is how we collect the signal. On the right-hand side, I have a server log just to demonstrate what the customer sees on the back end and the request that they make to us and the response they get. So if, if I just run test test, um, click login, the logs on the right-hand side uh, flow through. Uh, our customer made a request to our server with this JSON blob uh, with a bunch of business signal and some other signal that we request. And then finally, we respond with an action. Do you allow, do you block this? Is it a bot, true or false? And then we have some taxonomy, uh, threat profile, threat category uh, to really give transparency on, on what we've identified with this traffic. Um, now I'll actually run a Selenium bot, which, you know, is a pretty simple bot. Uh, and we should be able to catch it. Uh, hopefully it works. Let's see. All right, there it is. So we have Selenium Firefox. I just set it to run against that site. So it just ran pretty quickly. You might have not seen it. But here's the response now. The action is block and bot is true. Uh, and then we have some threat categories. So uh, that concludes uh, our bot mitigation uh, presentation. And uh, uh, thanks for giving us the opportunity to talk. Does anybody have any questions uh, that myself or Russ can answer? Hi, uh, let's see. Yes, we have one question here. In terms of machine learning from data, does this data come from security information and event manage management SIEM tool? Uh, most of the data comes from signal that we collect via our JavaScript payload or the mobile SDK. Uh, we also have other feeds that are coming from, for example, the Threat Intel team uh, might have created a gray list of botnet machines or other ones. So all those things play a role. Um, and then we can also actually have our customers uh, send us a feed of, of their data to augment our data a little bit further. Okay, terrific. Now, what is the best way to for um the participants, we have almost 400 of them. Uh, um, how could they contact you? What is the best way? Uh, good question. Uh, you, you can send me an email, uh, Mike Terry at whiteops.com. Uh, Terry with one R. Uh, okay. Yeah. Otherwise, visit our website and, and there should be a contact. Okay. Yeah, I, I would say go to whiteops.com and click on the contact us uh, component of the website. Terrific, terrific. I'll actually, uh, I'll send that through the chat uh, so that everyone uh, so that everyone gets that. Thank you so much for uh, for joining us. It was very very nice and detailed. I appreciate your time. Great, thank you so much. Our next round of uh, of, of expertise from one of the top companies out there, Checkpoint Software Technologies. Uh, Winston, can you hear us? Hi, hi everyone. Uh, good to be here. So. Um, this is one thing in, in particular. I thought that um, uh, Frederick's um, all of his, all of his general comments were very very insightful, and a lot of it um, bleeds into what I wanted to talk about today. So what I prepared is a presentation about absolute zero trust. So, I, so the terminology in itself is very popular, especially now. Um, so we're we're getting um, a lot of feedback from customers asking how how should they approach zero trust as a strategy. Um, but in that conversation, I've also noticed that there's a lot of confusion in understanding what the outcome is or what the objective of Zero Trust is. So today, uh, what I would like to do is go through first understanding what Zero Trust is, um, and then I'll provide a little more background into what brought us to this point as it relates to Zero Trust, and then go through the principles from a strategy perspective. So in between, I'll probably check the uh, um, Q&A section for any questions that you may have. Um, Right, so you may have noticed also my uh, my contact information. I'll share it again to the end as well. So what Zero Trust is, 
So I decided to break it up into three different um, questions and responses. So uh, firstly, what it's not. So Zero Trust is not a product or service. So you cannot buy Zero Trust off the shelf and then become Zero Trust. Um, secondly, it's not an IT only project. It does involve heavily technology, but it's not only technology, that, technology that, that's involved. Um, and thirdly, it's not about getting rid of firewalls. And I'm not saying that just because I work for Checkpoint, but it's not about getting rid of firewalls at all. Um, what Zero Trust is. So the first thing to keep in mind that it's an architectural perspective. It's a way of state of mind in the way you address security from an, from an architectural perspective. And it's about never trusting and always verifying. And this is a very important element. It's about um, not trusting even though something, an, an asset, an endpoint, a data connection is within the organization as opposed to outside. So it's never about trusting. It's always about verification. And then thirdly, it's about increasing security adoption. So, so you can achieve this in many different ways. And the, one of the major drivers of security adoption should be about making security overall very simple, easy to understand, easy to implement, easy to operate. And when you do that, then you can move towards business enablement. So going to my third question and response is, how would you achieve zero trust? So how is that actually achieved? So first thing, your strategy has to be focused with business purpose in mind. So you consider what are the, the principles of zero trust, you understand what the objectives are, you understand what technologies and processes need to change, but how does it impact, impact your business operation? Um, secondly, you have to leverage the experience, the ex expertise of different partners, your vendors and your staff. It is one of the most collaborative exercises that you will ever have to go through as it relates to architectural design and deployment. And then thirdly, it's not a quick fix. So you need to also accept that uh, it's not a one-off project and will take you some time to get to that point where you can say you have a zero trust posture. Right, so what brought us to this point? So it's really a shift in the way we've designed our, our network and security infrastructure. So very simply, we had a, a different approach uh, many years back based on the, the concept of a perimeter. And the perimeter was very clear, was very obvious, it was easy to understand. This circle of trust, this perimeter, um, really fought, fell in line with um, how we designed or identified certain types of different parts of the organization, such as a data center or a branch office, for example. You know the boundaries based on the perimeter that you've defined. Anything that's within your perimeter is trusted. Anything that's outside of your perimeter is not trusted. And that was sort of the way we would have designed our network infrastructure. And then on top of that, we would have addressed security in the same way. Anything within the network um, and communicating from a north south perspective is where you would look at security threats versus lateral movement of threats. Um, now things are very, very different, especially consider what, what's going on right now. We're all working from home. So we're connecting from almost anywhere using any device. And sometimes it's a, it's a combination of proper devices as well as BYOD. Um, also, we're shifting applications from outside of our data center, moving it into the public cloud domain. Um, we're also leveraging SaaS applications. And then we're making our, our offices and our buildings smart by using IoT. And consider it as well to what Frederick was saying before about IoT devices um, uh, exist even from your home network perspective and can be used as a, as a point of entry. So um, considering all of these different data points and access points, um, how would you then define where's your perimeter? Where does it begin? Where does it end? When it's pretty much everywhere. And this is what is driving zero trust uh, to be able to adopt a new way of security posture relative to how we operate in the modern day. So uh, Forrester analysts have defined um, seven principles that drive um, the zero trust approach. Um, so you have these, these are the seven principles and what you would notice is that automation and orchestration as well as visibility and analytics, these principles are pervasive to all of the five core tenants of, um, of zero trust from networks to workloads that's cloud and and on-prem um, to your people and devices. Of course, your devices are, are used by your by your staff. And then that's, that's another aspect. People is very, um, to be very fluid because it doesn't also refer to, um, always refer to members of staff. It can be consultants, partners, even customers. So people can be taken in many, many different perspectives and then data, protecting the data, your data, wherever it may exist. 
Um, what you're looking at here is a is a, a diagram, a blueprint diagram that was done following a security workshop. So one of the things that, that Checkpoint is doing is helping customers understand their their network architecture, network and security architecture as it relates to um, how they've designed systems relative to, to their business needs and puts it in a, into a format where they could better understand how all of the different pieces fall together. And then we can overlay on top of that zero trust. Um, so this zero trust workshop is helping customers understand what is the approach with regards to zero trust, what changes that need to be made. Um, also understand what are the controls or what are the changes uh, with regards to processes that need to be inserted from a zero trust perspective, as well as identifying um, any um, inconsistencies or overlapping technology. So a part of it as well as also reducing costs through, um, through consolidation. So going through the, the principles of zero trust, as you can see, they all fit in a very logical sense, different depending on your network architecture. I think going through the understanding is a hurdle by itself, and then putting the pieces together as it relates to zero trust is the next step. So over the, over the next few slides, what, I'll, what I intend to do is sort of go through each one of these principles um, but I want you to also keep in mind how does it relate to your organization, to your infrastructure, to your service delivery. So let's start with network. So it's all about preventing um, the lateral movement of threats. So I mentioned before, in the traditional sense, you were more concerned with, you may have been more concerned with north-south because you know what's inside can be trusted versus what's on the outside, you cannot be trusted. But the essence of zero trust as it relates to network is about divide and rule. You need to um, consider an, an approach that will divide your network as granular as possible. If you can achieve um, micro segmentation, that's excellent. This is what you need to, 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 um, to that should be your goal. And if not, you try to get as low as, um, as, as close as possible in terms of segmentation. Uh, one of the challenges that you may encounter is that not everything can be identified, um, such as IT or IoT um, technology. So you need to overcome that burden or that challenge of um, not being able to identify automatically what are the IoT technologies that exist within, within your environment. And that, another challenge that I'm seeing that needs to be solved is um, reducing or losing the dependency of IP addresses to define a specific endpoint. So try to focus as well on um, identifying your endpoints based on a functional attribute, uh, such as a virtual machine tag, an identity as authenticated based on your machine working with a NAT, for example. Um, there are many different ways to identify the identity of an endpoint, but focus on the function. And then, and then thirdly, um, another dependency that you need to sort of reduce is identifying communication flows based on a protocol name or service port, and, and, and work more towards or look more towards identifying the application. So application awareness is a very important aspect to divide and rule from a, a network perspective. When you do that, you can then essentially achieve a business-centric way of security policy definition. Now, moving to the cloud, there are several challenges um, that, that's different to what you would have on an on-prem traditional network perspective. Now, when you, when you talk about cloud, you need to always keep in mind that cloud changes and scales at a rate that you know, no average um, analyst or, or network team can keep up with. So with that in mind, your technology, the way you provision services needs to move at that same um, pace. So that in itself um, is, a, is an overarching problem to solve when it comes to moving to the cloud. Now I'm, I'm gonna pause that for a second um, because to me the three most important um, things that you need to solve from a zero trust perspective, and if you do, then you could also address the speed aspect is um, visibility, the second is compliance, and the third is threat prevention. So these, these are the three fundamental problems you need to solve when it comes to moving to the cloud. So as I said before about speed, things can change at any time. Visibility is key. So you have virtual machines, you have serverless functions, you have containers, you may have storage buckets, you may exist. These sorts of attributes may exist across multiple cloud platforms and be provisioned um, by or across multiple corporate accounts. So visibility is key. The second aspect is compliance. How do you know if you are configuring your cloud infrastructure according to best practice or according to some sort of compliance or regulatory check that you need to, um, to adhere to? So continuous compliance is key. Now today we solve um, those two problems 
um, using a technology called Doom 9. So Doom 9 um, is helping customers identify very easily all of your assets and then move from identifications to, um, to compliance. And from compliance perspective, it, um, it, it does two things. One, it helps you understand your configuration from a best practice perspective, but also allows you the ability to invoke auto-remediation using CloudBots. And then the third problem to solve is threat prevention. And this is doing the same level of real-time threat prevention from a multi-layered perspective um, for any advanced or more sophisticated attack that will exist in your cloud environment itself. So these are the things that you need to keep in mind when, it moves to, when you're moving to cloud. Uh, if you are there already, then I'm sure you are facing some of these already. So what I, what I, what I have here now is an example of a, one of the views within Doom 9. And it's called clarity. Uh, as the name would suggest, it's, uh, it's supposed to clarify or help you clarify what you own and what you've deployed. So uh, what you're seeing here is a bunch of assets that were deployed in AWS. Um, based on us seeing or looking into the configuration, we can easily identify not only what's configured, but what can communicate with each other, as well as what has internet access versus what's not. Now, if you would imagine, how would you, have do, how would you do this in a manual sense? It would be very painstaking. So we can do this in real time. Now, when you go towards um, zero trust as people, um, this, this is where things get very, very interesting as you sort of unfold the story of zero trust. So the, the, the one, one thing that you need to keep in mind is that over 80% of breaches start with um, the people aspect, weak credentials, stolen credential goes back to what Frederick was saying about phishing and email campaigns and the movement of malware. So you need to protect the identity of your users. Now, making a decision whether to allow or deny based on the identity or authentication is an excellent first step, first and second step, but it's not enough. Context is very key when it comes to zero trust. Um, so, so what we do from a, from a checkpoint perspective by utilizing identity engines is try to uh, apply more context to each user that's trying to connect to the environment, such as looking at the device, whether that device is compliant or not, looking at the geolocation, the time of the connection, and the connection type, and then we can make a well-informed decision. Now, layered on top of that, if we can understand context, then we could also identify anomalies. For example, a user may be connecting from a specific device out of the US and then an hour later out of Europe. We know this is impossible unless you know, he or she is Superman. So this is a problem that you need to solve by applying context to a decision making. Now, as, it go, as you think about from a device perspective, um, I think here it starts to get a little more complicated to achieve. Um, and one of the reasons for that is because your endpoints or devices in general form the basis of the largest attack surface within your network infrastructure. And on top of that, the variety is significant. So let's think about it from an, a traditional endpoint. You have laptops, desktops, servers. You have different types of operating systems from Windows, Mac, and Linux. And then you have the mobile aspect, not to mention the fact that some mobile um, assets are company-owned versus BYOD. And IoT in itself is a, a whole new ballgame for us. It's a new generation, a new landscape of attacks. So IoT in itself has challenges because one, there's no built-in security and vendors or manufacturers of IoT devices, they don't actually take security very seriously. A good example is the fact that um, either they, ver they are very slow to respond to patching weaknesses or they leave behind um, bu um, burnt in or built in um, administrative passwords, passwords, which can be easily compromised. So IoT in itself adds another level of complexity. So from a device perspective, what we've decided to do is approach this from, similar to what we do at the network. So we understand that from a network perspective, you need to divide. So we, are, we can potentially or actually achieve micro segmentation by moving uh, or isolating each device down to the per device level understanding um, the compliance of the, or the health of this specific asset before allowing the user to connect, providing a secure, secure connection over VPN, and then providing multi-layered threat prevention, which you're seeing some examples to the top left-hand corner. So this is what you would typically do at the network level, but now we can push this down to the endpoint level. So this is um, sort of an, um, uh, an ER sort of um, endpoint uh, device EDR perspective of doing device um, security. 
Um, similarly, from a mobile perspective, we do a very, very similar uh, strategy where we do on-device network um, protection. But on top of that, we look at very mobile specific attacks. Um, for example, determining if the device was jailbroken or rooted, identifying whether or not there may be a malicious application installed, or maybe if this device is trying to gain access to your corporate network and it doesn't meet some sort of compliance check. Maybe it doesn't have a VPN um, set up or it's not going to a trusted communication path. So this is what we will do on both fronts. IoT, um, we enforce policy, policy micro-segmentation as well as um, based on understanding or inheriting attributes about the IoT device, we can understand not only what it's intended to do, but we could also understand the risks that are, uh, that are involved and enforce IPS um, signatures to the IoT device itself. Um, when it comes to data, um, unfortunately, there's no you know, quick fix. There's no silver bullet to solving all of the problems as it relates to data. So from a zero trust perspective, a lot of the strategies has to do with how do you protect data? And what's making data difficult to protect is that it can exist almost anywhere, can be manipulated by any one of the members of staff for different reasons, of course. And because it moves um, laterally within your organization, you sort of have to enforce security, but, but, at, the, but at the same time, not inhibit um, business and productivity. So we solve um, the, um, the aspects around data security from a zero trust perspective using a variety of technologies that you should consider as well. Um, one, for example, is doing digital rights management, which is about encrypting the, um, the, the, the data. And regardless of wherever it sits, wherever it moves, whether it's inside of the organization or outside, the security and the permission to go with that file wherever it is. Um, you can consider also containers. We use something called Capsule Workstation. That is a container, it's a containerized application um, that, that you can install on a, on a mobile device. This is a perfect, perfect scenario is when it's BYOD. So you don't want company data to be mixed with personal data, as well as things like device security, endpoint um, encryption, as well as removable media encryption. And this is important in case the device gets lost or stolen. With regards to transit, um, data loss prevention is absolutely important. So again, as mentioned before, um, in, early in, in, in today's um, event, is that um, attackers are looking for ways to compromise your network. And they do this by trying to steal either personal identifiable information, um, intellectual property, marketing information that, that can be used, or financial information that can be used against the company. Uh, whether it's a one-time attack or whether it's to set up um, the baseline for a well-coordinated future attack. So data loss prevention is absolutely important. So we do this today. Again, Checkpoint is a software company. We do a lot of development. Um, we, have a different, we have different pockets of R&D um, to and across two different parts of the world. So our intellectual property is very, very sacred to us. Um, so we use the LP to understand and classify this um, our data provide sensitivity levels for each one of the data, and they have, therefore apply permissions on how they should be disseminated. Now, when, when going to cloud, you have to look at it as another perspective as well, when, when your data lives in the cloud. This is a SaaS, from a SaaS perspective. So we use CloudGuard SaaS, which is a SaaS application used to protect other SaaS applications. Um, our approach is similar to a CASB, but we do additional security, a traditional CASB will not do. Um, such as looking at the data loss prevention, such as um, looking at device security so that the device is trusted and in, and in compliance um, before allowing the user to gain access to your SaaS application. And because we're cloud-based, we operate virtually inline. Um, visibility is very, very important. As mentioned before, there are, there are two um, principles of zero trust that are pervasive to all layers of the, of, um, of the zero trust um, principle, the other five layers. Visibility is one of them. If you do not, if you cannot see nor understand, you, you will not know how to respond. And this is where uh, we take visibility extremely important. So built into the management center of, of our architecture um, is a set of um, default views or customizable views that can let one person understand from end to end my security posture. Each one of these, if you look at the top left and um, example, each one of those widgets are very interactive. So you can look at a high level um, understanding of what are some attacks, 
that may or may not have been going on right now, and then zero in from understanding the attack, looking at the raw logs, or from the raw logs into an action to remediate. Uh, we also looked at compliance as well, trying to provide real-time scoring of how well your environment or your different endpoints are configured from a security best practice perspective. Automation absolutely needed across, across the board. Um, leveraging automation means that you can speed up security operations, speed up provisioning of new services, especially from a cloud perspective. And if you can do that, you can make um, deploying any, any new service, whether it's the internal or external customers, faster and see more secure by using automation. And we do this today um, based on um, our, our, at our core, our operating system includes a RESTful API. So you can use this at this API to automate typical security functions in a very in a workflow perspective, or use the same API to speed up detection and response. For example, uh, a device may have been found to be compromised. Maybe there's a malware, and we can quarantine the, the device once we identify identify and then we respond automatically. Um, this, this specific slide is just to present from at a, at a very high level where our architecture pool comes together and it's called Infinity, which is a zero trust architecture. The goal here is that we can solve the problems by pulling together a number of different technology that works tightly together, meaning it's a central pane of glass view for good management and visibility and automation, as well as because yeah, um, and it's core it also has RESTful API, which means that you can also extend its capabilities by integrating with other te technologies, whether it's a NAS or whether it's a dual factor or multi factor authentication system, for example. Um, the, it, gives, it opens up opportunities for greater adaptability. So, to summarize, um, think about zero trust, about, is about never trusting, always verifying. Uh, from an architectural perspective, we want simplicity is key. So this is so an approach such as Infinity, which pulls together a number of different technologies, given also the opportunity to integrate into other tools, um, is, a, is a more efficient way or more effective way of adopting zero, tr zero trust. And then thirdly, going back to one of the examples I showed about a blueprint from another customer's environment, if you're wondering, how do I start? How, uh, what are the principles? How does it apply to my organization? Chefwin is offering customers a zero trust workshop. So if you're interested, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, my email information is at the bottom of the screen. Um, welcome questions. So, um, so that's all I have for you. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. <clears throat> Perfect. All right. We have a couple of questions for you. Yep. Uh, let's take a look. Uh, it was mentioned about segmentations of networks. What about yep. complete separation for networks? following the zero trust policy, complete separation? Um, I'm not sure if I understand the question. So because you could, it, it seems open-ended because you can do complete se um, separation. Yep. Um, again, it's based on this, it's based on the scenario. So maybe I'm, I'm interpreting it as doing like an air gap. An air gap is, is, uh, is one approach, but it's not foolproof because we've seen, we've seen uh, avenues of compromise there. Think of it as, um, uh, IoT, for example, communicates not over IP, but also communicates over Bluetooth. So segmentation is key. Um, you can choose to segment based, based on having separate um, routing and switching infrastructure. You can look at segmentation down to the switch port level or the device or application level. So it depends on the scenario, wherever you can mix security with, um, with um, whatever makes business sense, given the scenario. So, but yes, it's possible. Probably. And I would say uh, probably for your biggest or most valuable assets, you would want to have that separate from the network. Yes. Yeah. Um, after doing a data, you know, evaluation. Um, how could a malicious actor beat MFA? If a quick explanation is possible. Yeah. Um, but through interception, actually goes back to I think Frederick um, covered a few examples. So from a multi-factor perspective. Um, if, uh, if the user account was or machine was compromised, um, they can start off a chain of uh, a reconnaissance, start off reconnaissance and then start off a chain of events that can lead towards compromising MFA. One, one common example is sending us an SMS phishing or smishing attack to take over or to gain access to the user's mobile device and intercept the SMS aspect to the second, maybe multi-factors and MS, uh, an SMS token message. Uh, that's one way if you take over that, that part of the machine. 
um, if, if, for example, it may be a token sent via email, um, getting access to the user's email addresses or, or email accounts through redirection or forwarding is another way of doing it as well. So it just depends. But what's very common is that the attack in most instances um, is not one off. So it starts off with surveillance. Uh, attackers, sophisticated attackers, will spend some time doing surveillance to understand how communication flows and what are the technologies in place to so then begin how to execute a better coordinated attack. Okay, we just got another one in. Let's take a look. We partner with several IoT discovery engines and can implement security policy based on information provided by them. If you want to explore the more uh, with your particular AR model, we can have someone. All right, so this, I believe, was an answer to um, a question we had had with deploying AR headsets, uh, basically uh, treating them as IoT uh, endpoints with MD. Yep. So I think that's actually uh, being handled. And I believe that uh, actually we have a couple more. Um, what are some of the measures customers are taking to prepare for post COVID-19 return uh, to normal operations? Okay, so so this, if again, th th things seems to be changing almost on a day-to-day -day basis, um, but I, I just wanna give you, I'll give you two, two scenarios that are, that's coming up more often now. Um, one of it is cloud. I think um, cloud has proven its worth as it relates to disaster recovery and business continuity. So I had a, a very interesting conversation a couple of days ago with a CTO, and he had described his journey to cloud using Azure what had, was met with some resistance. Now, um, over the, the recent pandemic, they were forced to all work from home, including their data center staff, which was very unprecedented for their organization. It's a 24 by seven operation. Um, and as a result, they were still able to provision new services and support services. So cloud adoption is a major driver of what is expected post COVID-19. The second thing is about budget and finance. So um, it's quite obvious that COVID-19 has had or has been having a very um, difficult time for most of us and from an economic impact perspective. So most of my customers are preparing for reduction in expenditure, reduction in IT budget. So some of the ways they are trying to solve that is one of it is cloud, of course, moving infrastructure to the cloud, but also moving applications to the cloud, such as SaaS. Um, other ways are um, doing software-defined networking or virtualized network functions in, a, in, a, in, a, in an effort to reduce the footprint on a per-site basis, um, as well as site, site connectivity using SASE as a new operational model, a new technological model for for site-to-site -site connectivity, as well as user-to-site-to-site -to -site connectivity. Um, another way of solving the cost um, challenges is moving away from CapEx to OpEx. So you only pay for what you use, which sounds a bit in like an insurance slogan, but you, uh, that, that, that's the, those are some of the things that I'm hearing more. Yep. Okay, I think we've got, uh, and it is, uh, last question is, um, what are some of the major, most commonly, uh, most common security challenges uh, that are that are faced by your clients these days. Okay. Um, there yeah, they are. I mean, it's. They, it, I, I would. I'll be honest to say that six months ago, I probably would have given you very different answers to that question. So, but given COVID nineteen over the last two or three months, um, the first one that comes to mind is connectivity. So, um, checkpoint fell into that same category as well. Um, uh, I think we had about 30, 40% of our organization uh, was set up to work remotely. Uh, almost overnight, we had to convert that to 100% remote workforce. So which means trying to figure out how to provide connectivity, secure connectivity, having the backend capacity to support the growth as well as scalability from a security perspective coming from different devices at any time. Um, the second problem um, I'm hearing um, that customers have faced over the recent time is about operational in, um, efficiencies. So um, knowing that everything is on-prem, deployment or fixing, doing a break fix in, the, in their own organization to support services, even if it's for internal customers, was a challenge. So what they had to do was to speed up their, um, their process or their migration to public cloud. Now, that in itself has technical challenges. But one of the things that came up very often with that shift to cloud very quickly is the question, am I doing it the right way? 
what what are we how, what exactly did we move up there because there are different people working in their public cloud domain so they were trying to figure out well am i doing it right so that's the second problem and then the third one is about endpoint security i think it again goes back again i i think i, re, I really enjoy frederick's um comments it goes back to everything that frederick was talking about um about endpoints and user security so um covid 19 um had a lot of different had, had a lot of emotions attached to it and um, attackers were using the fears the concerns the frustrations of, of um, end users in order to use that as an exploit mechanism for malware for phishing for, for smishing attacks um, so organizations finally took notice that their endpoints were very weak and easy targets so they identified that more could be done from an endpoint device security perspective, as well as protecting users against phishing, smishing, and malware campaigns, um, as well as understanding um, how to keep up with emerging attacks. Just think about how many lessons learned we've taken away from, from these Zoom vulnerabilities. So keeping up with that from a, from a uh, news perspective was very difficult. So those are the three things. Gotcha. That's why we're using Cisco WebEx. Yeah. So. <laughs> So yeah. far, I, you know, my fingers are crossed. No one's bombed us. Uh, thank you, Winston, so much for your time. I do appreciate it. Uh, thanks to all the people at uh, Checkpoint for doing, doing such a great job. And uh, I've just um, sent out uh, to all of our participants your email address. So if there's any follow up questions, they can ping you with that. Absolutely. Yep. That'd Winston, thank you so much. And now we're going to bring on Ron Ford from uh, DHS slash CISA. Uh, Ron, are you with us? I am. Good morning or good afternoon, Bradford. <laughs> hey, how are you, Ron? Good to see you again. I'm doing well. Same we here. We have a TV show pretty soon. Uh, you know, we have good practice so far. Yeah, we have good banter too. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, for our participants out there, there's uh, almost 350 of you uh, still with us. Thank you again for uh, joining us. Uh, you've stayed with us this thus far. Ron is wonderful. He's been with the Secret Service. Uh, excuse me, with the DHS and CISA for quite a long time. He's going to go over tools and strategies and best practices. Uh, Ron, take it away before I stutter even more. All right, take care. <laughs> Thanks again, Bradford. You got uh, it. Yeah, and thank you all for, for sticking with us. Uh, glad to be here. So I'm, I'm Ron Ford. Uh, I am with the Department of Homeland Security and more uh, intimately under the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, uh, also known as CISA. Uh, we love security so much that we stuck it in our name twice. So I'm going to go over a bit about uh, my organization as well as uh, dealing with cyber resilience during COVID-19. So I'm going to go briefly over our role at CISA as well as risk management around COVID-19 as well as uh, best practices that I think we all uh, are coming more familiar with these days now. So uh, I just wanted to emphasize the uh, the little uh, image at the bottom here about the the bear and the two people running uh, from the bear. Uh, typically, it's been the the uh, the ideology and the thought that you have to be faster than the slowest person. And I, I think that's kind of been the the mantra uh, previously. But uh, you know, now these days, it's more about working together, uh, collaborating with uh, partners, with competitors, with everyone to ensure that uh, all parts of cyber resilience are being uh, mitigated uh, across all, uh, all the industries. So it's more of a team effort these days. So a bit about CISA, our, our role really is to lead the nation um, with regard to managing risk and understanding what those risks are with critical infrastructure. Uh, ultimately, we want to be the nation's uh, risk advisors uh, and to understand how we can continue to be secure, how we can continue to be resilient, both from a physical and from a cyber security perspective. So again, we leave that, that effort. Uh, we do it in several different buckets. Uh, we focus a lot on the federal network protection we are uh, the federal government's uh, main cybersecurity hub. We work with a lot of other executive uh, federal agencies across uh, the government <clears throat> to ensure that we are protecting uh, all different parts of, uh, of federal networks. 
Uh, we also uh, focus on comprehensive cyber protection. And what that really means is that uh, we focus a lot of our support also on public, uh, state, local governments uh, as well, also with uh, uh, private industry as well. We understand that this, uh, the threats out there just don't stop at certain doors. They affect all of us. Uh, the third bucket that we focus on is infrastructure resilience and field operations. So my program, the Cybersecurity Advisor Program, which I'll talk about in a, in a slide or two, focuses on that field operation perspective where we're reaching out beyond DC, beyond the, uh, the metro area, and focusing a lot on what the regions are uh, challenged with in terms of being resilient. Uh, the last part is emergency communications. So if you think about emergency comms, 911, first responders, we also have a play in that in terms of making sure that telecom networks are, uh, are ready and are continuing to operate as they should. Uh, so we also focus on both kind of state emergency 911 as well as kind of the more broader uh, challenges and implications, especially with some of the telecom providers as well. So today's risk landscape, and I think the, I, I probably can't emphasize this anymore, but we are faced with a multitude of different threats out there. Um, usually there are a couple of, you know, major risks that are threats that are happening right now. Uh, you know, with today's evolving landscape, uh, we're faced with a multitude at the same time, whether it's the pandemics uh, or extreme weather, uh, cyber attacks or accidental or technical failures or if there is some type of insider threat or malicious activity that's happening internal to your networks. Now we're faced with a multitude of, of those different uh, threat uh, indicators. So how do we continue to attack those different threats and, and help to reduce the likelihood that something will happen, uh, whether it's a cyber disruption or a physical attack? We have to be, in, we have to be ready for those, those types of, uh, of threats so that we can continue to manage and operate our normal uh, ways of life. I'm gonna go a bit over my program, the Cybersecurity Advisor Program within CISA. So essentially my mission is to help lead that effort to strengthen and secure resilience across critical infrastructure. So how do we do that? So we do it in several different ways. Uh, and, uh, and these are these overlap and we, we perform these different duties uh, every single day in, in any form or fashion. So we assess, we provide critical infrastructure, cyber risk assessments, we promote best practices and risk mitigation strategies. We also build, we help to build capacity and capability, whether it's providing training and awareness or helping to uh, support incident response planning or business continuity development. We have a wide range of different resources and materials to help support that, those endeavors. Uh, we also educate and inform. We help to raise awareness, whether it's through cyber resilience workshops or it's uh, participating on panel discussions or providing briefings like now. Uh, the last couple are listening. A uh, large part of my job is listening to what are the challenges? What are the obstacles? How can we help to make those obstacles a little lower, a little easier to navigate around, uh, but also understanding what can we do internally in terms of you know the capabilities and resources that we provide how can we continue to refine and retool them so that they're more digestible and uh, more usable to uh, to the our external partners the last one is coordinating so we do a bit of coordination in terms of incident response and support as well as taking some of those lessons learned so that we can continue to provide uh, sufficient and adequate uh, resources to uh, affected entities All right, so I'll briefly go over our map here. So uh, I'm, I'm again, I'm the region one cybersecurity advisor, but we've broken uh, the regions down into 10 distinct regions and that's by FEMA's uh, breakdown and designation. So we've been able to uh, at least have one cybersecurity advisor deployed within each region. You'll see that there's some areas that have two, uh, some that have three. Uh, so if you're interested in learning more about your regional or district cybersecurity advisor, uh, I would encourage you to go to cyberadvisor at cisa.dhs.gov and learn more about what resources that we have to offer. Uh, you know, we understand that each region is different in terms of industries, in terms of sectors. So we're always interested in learning more about what are some of the challenges and obstacles that 
uh, the different industries are facing so that we can continue to be better stewards and better custodians as well. So a little bit about COVID-19 and, and how CISAs play and role in this uh, has become, I think, pretty key. So back in, I believe it was uh, uh, March, um, when this started to kick off with COVID-19 and guidelines, uh, we produced the risk management um, uh, insights product for dealing with COVID-19. And what does that really mean? So we focused it a lot on the executives to help them think through some of the supply chain, some of the physical uh, and cybersecurity issues that might arise from COVID-19, from the spread of it. So inside that guide, you can find that there's information on inf infrastructure protection, as well as supply chain. Uh, and then on the other side, we focus a lot on cybersecurity of organizations. What are some of the actions that you can take uh, and apply within your own environments for both your workforce as well as for your customers as well? If you're interested in learning more about that, please feel free to go to cisa.gov uh, forward slash coronavirus to learn more about that. We have a lot of information out there. So a little bit more about what are some of the offerings and what are some of the tools and materials that we have. So uh, recently we produced the Cyber Essentials Toolkit. Uh, it's a whole litany of different resources to help you step through being cyber secure. Um, we've taken the time to really think through how can we, how can we engage better, how can we be better stewards of providing materials and resources. And so we understand that we are one of the tools in your toolkit. You have you know, the private industry, which has, you know, their wide variety and, and, and wide vast of resources. Uh, but we also want to ensure that, you know, from a federal standpoint, you can understand and be aware of what's out there, as well as what are some of the things that you can take advantage of. Um, we all, I've also put up here the National Cybersecurity Alliance. It's a nonprofit organization that has partnered with CISA to provide even more materials and resources out there. Uh, whether it's working from home, uh, ensuring that you have, you know, best practices in, in place, whether it's, you know, uh, securing your own home networks, as well as, uh, you know, information on your work environment. How can you start to move out uh, in terms of once you, uh, once you get back to working on site in your physical buildings, what are some of the next steps that you can probably take uh, from, uh, you know, working from home and, and transitioning into your work environment. So that leads into the next point I wanted to make about the hybrid work model and what the reconstitution of businesses and, and what the community, uh, you know, what that impact might look like. So uh, definitely, you know, just keep in mind that as we go into the fall, uh, they're going to be hybrid models of varying sizes and varying scales that I think need to be, um, need to be aware, need to be appreciated, need to be thought out. So I think a lot of organizations now are really starting to think about that, whether it's the state governments and the Department of Education and how, uh, you know, as we roll back from a virtual uh, standpoint uh, in terms of education, for instance, how does that translate now into us being socially distant, you know, coming into the fall, uh, how do colleges and universities start to scale up their uh, courses and curriculums now that, you know, we are going back, you know, into some level of normalcy. So there's a lot to be thought out right now in terms of what's certain, what's uncertain, um, how can we continue to address some of these challenges knowing that we want to get back to some level of normalcy. We just need to be thoughtful about it as well. So I would encourage you uh, to also uh, please visit your state uh, government websites as well as your, your uh, local government websites to ensure that you're following the guidelines that have, that have been prescribed to you so that we can make sure that, you know, if we need to be socially distant, continue to do that as well. But also just keep in mind that, you know, all the government agencies uh, from the state and local level are also facing their own challenges with thinking a lot about how do we continue on. The last point I wanted to make here is about telework uh, capability. Uh, this has really been a, a good exercise, for better or for worse, to understand what are the limitations, whether it's network capacity, whether it's moving people onto a virtual environment and you need to scale up uh, you know, your virtual servers, as well as understanding what are the implications with moving everyone on 
uh, onto virtual networks where there might be uh, information sensitivities, um, with the type of data that you process, also the workload that has now been transferred onto your IT uh, staff. Uh, so understanding what those challenges are, I think, is really important, as well as how do you address some of those, you know, possible new uh, security challenges with moving everyone online. Uh, so it's really important to to use this as a great opportunity to look at business continuity, to look at you know, uh, continued uh, services and what's the priority for you. So that's where we start to think about resilience. So the threat landscape, I just wanted to briefly go over this, but essentially I think you're all pretty aware of the Internet of Things. So uh, we have a, a, a wide range of uh, different technology that gives us a lot of information, gives us a, a lot of access to different uh, points of data that we didn't have before. Well, that ultra also introduces a whole new threat landscape for us. So you can talk to your smart home device, you can talk to your car, you can connect via, you know, your smartphone to your car. You can also connect your car to your home network. You know, these all bring about different challenges for us to make sure that information that is being collected as well as uh, distributed, um, you know, from these main sources that there isn't uh, you know, any type of compromise and you can, how can we help to lessen the, the, uh, the risk of our information being leaked? So we have to ensure that we have some best practices in place, whether it's secure coding or whether it's changing the default password on all of the home devices that we have right now. So I wanted to go briefly over just some of the recent publications that CISA has, uh, has published. Back on uh, May 23rd, we released a joint announcement with the FBI on the Chinese government targeting COVID-19 research organizations across the country. So, um, you know, we put out some guidance on what to look for, where it might be attributed to, uh, and, and we're actually focusing a lot on reaching out to those healthcare partners to ensure that they're aware of what's happening, but also to afford them with different resources that they could take advantage of. Uh, back on May 13th, uh, we also provided the Cyber Resource Hub, which is a list of free and available cybersecurity uh, assessments and resources. Uh, all of the resources that CISA provides are free and voluntary. Whether you're, our, whether you're taking advantage of some of our assessments uh, or our penetration testing or signing up for our newsletters, everything is free. You've already paid for it with your tax dollars, so we're not going to double charge you. Uh, the last uh, bulletin I wanted to point out was back on May the 12th, where, uh, again, CISA and FBI, we published a cyber alert uh, highlighting the top 10 most exploited vulnerabilities between 2016 and 2019. I think of this as the, the David Letterman top 10. Uh, you know, we've, we've, we've seen these vulnerabilities pretty consistently over an extended amount of time. They're not going away, and we're trying to understand what are the challenges, what are the issues with these ex with these vulnerabilities that continue to be prevalent out in the wild. You know, what are the problems? You know, is it because there are underlying issues with some of the systems that continue to be on the top 10 on the hit list? Uh, you know, do they have, uh, you know, underlying conditions where they have other vulnerabilities that are still prevalent? I think that's one of the things that we need to think through as we start to think about how can we continue to close out some of these gaps and some of the more common gaps and vulnerabilities that we continue to face. So I'm not going to belabor this, uh, the group, but you know, these are very common cyber threats that you, you probably are all familiar with, with ransomware, with phishing, with a lack of uh, software patching you know, for various reasons. Also, misconfiguration of technology. You know, those are pretty big issues that I think we need to continue to focus on. So we, you know, at CISA, we try to provide you with guidance, whether it's, you know, patching on, you know, certain systems. We provide a, a litany of different cyber bulletins and alerts uh, each day. Um, I get a lot of those. Uh, but, you know, we want to make sure that we're putting on information as quickly as possible and that you can take action against. So, you know, if you go, if you scan down the list here, you can see that these are not uncommon things. The, the one I wanted to point out here was the advanced persistent threats. Uh, these typically are well organized, uh, well funded, highly capable. You heard these, uh, you know, some of these, uh, you know, phrases before, uh, you know, in some of the presentations that you've uh, that you've heard today. 
these advanced persistent threats, they don't they, they typically focus on, you know, and target specific organizations and groups, but don't consider yourself as one that they probably won't try to target. Uh, they're targeting everyone as well. They're targeting whoever is the most vulnerable, whether it's, you know, the the small, you know, third tier organization that is in the supply chain of a critical manufacturer where they can bypass certain security elements and uh, security features, or they're targeting, you know, the top, you know, uh, 100, uh, you know, Fortune 500 organizations. They're targeting everyone. So it's really incumbent upon us to act upon, you know, being more defensive, being prepared if and when something does happen, that there are processes and procedures in place and capabilities in place that we can be resilient, we can lessen the likelihood of some type of disruption here. So I'll go a bit about, I'll go into a bit about cybersecurity and resilience. Um, so if you think about resilience in terms of your body, uh, it just doesn't happen overnight. You need to build up, you need to do certain things to make your body healthy. So if you think about that in terms of, you know, uh, the IT networks or the operational networks that you might manage or have some purview over, you have to think about it in the same way. Are you doing, you know, the software patching? Are you doing the logging? Are you doing the network configurations properly? Are you analyzing, uh, you know, what are the priorities of the organization so that that can feed into business continuity? Are you doing all these things to make the organization as resilient as, as much as you can? So, uh, you know, the, the one thing I wanted you all to take away is good health and resilience are, are really important and really key. Uh, you just can't start doing it, you know, the, the following day. It's as if, uh, you know, if you want to battle heart disease, you have to start way, way back before something happens. So you have to eat right. You have to exercise. You have to move your body. Same can be done, uh, you know, with cybersecurity. You have to start from somewhere before uh, something happens so that you can be uh, ready. Crit uh, criticality of periodic assessment. You can't understand what you're trying to defend if you don't know what's on your network or what can you, uh, what's important to you. So you have to start from somewhere. Uh, you have to measure, you know, how well you were able to defend against uh, uh, attacks. You know, you have to close out some of these uh, vulnerabilities to ensure that you're improving over time. So a lot of this is about lessons learned and maturity uh, of the organization, uh, of the capabilities, of the staff. It's a very comprehensive effort that needs to take place. And if, if you aren't aware of those things happening, maybe this is a great opportunity to look at the organization. So working towards cyber resilience. If you, if you start on that path, we encourage you to start somewhere, maybe with a framework, with the cybersecurity framework from the National Institute of Standards and Technology. That's a great resource to start from. Even if it might be too comprehensive for you, you can take away certain things from that that you can apply to your own environment, you know, whether it's starting to identify, uh, identify the critical services that you have, uh, creating some type of assessment uh, or asset management inventory, you know, you, you have to move through that whole process and understand what's important to the business because cybersecurity is just not a technology risk. It's a business risk because a lot of uh, the sources, a lot of the services and business functions are supported by IT. They're also supported by people uh, and the information. So it's really incumbent upon us to take a broad look at you know, what's important to the organizations, both public and private, understand what the risks are associated with them. And then if you've been able to document all that, you have to go and test it, see how well you can do, and then feed that back into your business continuity uh, plans or your disaster recovery plan. Uh, I think COVID-19 was a great, great exercise uh, for that, you know, to understand what are some of the challenges that we faced with now moving or transitioning a lot of the different services, um, you know, both physical and virtual to a different, uh, different environment. So I'll go a little bit into our resources here. So we, we both, uh, we, we battle or we, we straddle both the physical side and the, uh, and the cybersecurity side. So we have our protective security advisors who do the physical assessment. So if you think about the guards, gates, and the guns, the buildings, those are the, uh, our colleagues who focus on that. If you're interested in learning more about that, please feel free to contact us. 
Now, again, my cybersecurity advisor program, we focus a lot on providing advisory services so we can help you in certain situations where you're either looking at technical solutions or in improving upon some of those solutions, but we also look at uh, strategically looking at how you want to move the organization in terms of cybersecurity. So here's my used car salesman slide here. Uh, again, we've I've tried to kind of divide it into uh, two different categories, both you know from a strategic standpoint where you're looking at maturity, you're looking at overall resilience uh, from a holistic standpoint, imp implementation of those processes uh, around critical functions and services, but also from a technical standpoint, we're looking at how well operationally can the organization uh, maintain itself when there is some type of disruption. So whether it's a phishing campaign uh, or a vulnerability scanning or architecture design review, we're able to provide different types of resources from a snapshot perspective, providing you with information that you can take and apply uh, over the you know over a certain time period so that you can improve upon where you were yesterday. So again, these are all voluntary and provided at no cost. Best practices. So uh, we're uh, almost done, but I wanted to really foot stomp some of these best practices. And when I talk about making your own luck, luck is really about the opportunity and your capability to exercise and, and do these things and demonstrate this. So leadership has to have uh, a, a, you know, a foot in this. They have to own the issue. It's incumbent upon them. If you get leadership buy-in and support, that moves mountains for you in terms of closing out uh, different issues, also opening up you know, the justification for why you need to improve. Uh, again, COVID-19, I think, is a great example of that. Uh, good cyber hygiene, tackling and blocking. Uh, blocking. Uh, you know, these are great things that you need to do, whether it's vulnerability scanning, understanding you know, what's external facing and how well are we prepared you know, and, and can we defend uh, against those vulnerabilities? Uh, the third one is risk management. You know, how much of risk are you willing to accept, transfer, uh, outsource? Uh, balancing that act is, is no, uh, no easy task. So we understand that each organization is quite different, but you have to understand what the risks are and how can you weigh them uh, so that you can continue to, to, to provide your, your critical services. Be prepared. You have to start somewhere. Exercise. Even if you might not get the outcome that you intended, you can at least start from somewhere and then improve upon that. Uh, defending and, and continuing to operate. So when you do have a disruption, how well is the organization positioned to continue to operate? You know, can they continue to operate for a six-hour time period if there is you know, a moderate disruption or if there's a significant disruption? What's the time period that you can be offline or be disrupted that will uh, that won't impact your critical function your business you have to understand that the last part is leveraging the relationships again i'm foot stomping these things you know as we continue to see cyber threats uh, and target and targeted uh, incidents happening uh, each day we have to leverage the relationships you know if you're handling if you're managing an incident uh, on your own i would implore you to bring in as as appropriately the, the resources that you that can that you can be afforded to you, whether it's from a state government or whether it's a security vendor, you have to tackle this from a team perspective. All right. So lastly, now that I, I hope I haven't scared anyone, uh, I'm I'm usually the good cop in in these situations, but I open I wanted to open this up to questions if there were any, and thank you very much, Bradford, for for hosting this again. It was fun. Sure. Thanks. Uh, let's see. We do have some questions. Let's see. Uh, and they came all just barreling in. Let's take a look. <laughs> all right. Uh, here's an interesting one. <clears throat> I understand that Homeland Security works with the dark web. Are there any new organizations that are new and actively using the dark web that you could share with us? What sort of activities are occurring that you can share with us from recent events? Ah, that's a that's a great question. And um, you know, the, whenever someone says the dark web, I usually uh, think about the uh, the LifeLock commercials and uh, 
and uh, you know they're scanning for malicious activity for you. There are a lot yeah. of organizations out there, uh, cybersecurity firms um, and vendors that are doing active uh, scanning of the dark web. Um, right. You know, you know the federal agencies, you know FBI, CISA, um, you know some of the yeah. other key leader organizations. We're all looking into the dark web. So uh, I can't necessarily promote any private uh, vendors, but you know, if you can do a open source search, you know, on on Google, the the you know, on your Google later, you know, there are tons of different organizations out there that are doing dark web scanning, and that can provide you with uh, you know weekly reports on you know whether you you've seen activity you know on your social security number or your business. Uh, these firms are increasing the capability to provide the average citizen with information that I think has been pretty beneficial over the last three to five years. Okay. I got another great question here. Um, because there's so many different agencies now, uh, uh, CISA, Secret Service, FBI, um, what agency uh, handles which type of incident? So in terms of incident response, uh, I can probably you know, summarize it. When do they call you? When do they call the Secret Service? When do they call the FBI? Which is a great question. Yeah, that's a that's a great question, and I don't think that question is going away at all. <laughs> uh, you know, we emphasize for anyone to call who you're comfortable with. Now, I know that's pretty open ended, but sure. you know, if you have a relationship with your FBI field office or with local law enforcement, or uh, if you're familiar with the state fusion centers, uh, we emphasize you call who you're comfortable with. Uh, you know, CISA would love to be uh, the main center for taking in all cyber incidents, but we don't have the capacity. So that's why we like to share. Uh, so you can call, you know, the the FBI. You can visit their website. It's the Internet uh, Cyber Crimes Complaint Center. It's ic3.gov. Uh, they have a lot of information on there. So if you're interested in learning more about them, you know, I emphasize you to go there. If you want to come visit us at cisa.gov please feel free. We have a reporting button there. We can take in a lot of different information, but the, the key thing I want people to take back is you, you report, you call, you contact who you're comfortable with. So, uh, you know, if it's Secret Service, by all means, you know, one call is a, is a call to many on the back end. So if, you're, if you are reporting an incident, most likely that information is being shared uh, internally between the different uh, federal agencies. Terrific, terrific. Okay, let's take a look. Um, let's see, is there anything else? Of course, the always the questions about the slides. Yes, they will be shared. Um, and any specific um, NIST sections that the executives out there should take a look at? Yes, uh, so... Explain to the audience, most people do know what NIST is, but some may not. Yeah. Yeah, so the National Institute of Standards and Technology, they've been such a valuable resource uh, for quite a long time. Uh, you know, especially within cybersecurity, uh, you know, you can reference, I believe it's uh, Special Publication uh, 839, which I believe is the Risk Management Framework. Uh, it's a great, great starting point for uh, leaders, for industry leaders and, and private sector organizations to start to think about risk management. Um, you know, they start to get a little bit into the details about, you know, uh, security controls, but, you know, 853 uh, special pu publication, I think version four uh, is still uh, the, the most current, but that's another great way to introduce yourself into, uh, you know, cybersecurity. But, I, I, you know, 839, I think, is, is a great starting point. The NIST cybersecurity framework is, is a really valuable resource. Uh, it's been crosswalked, uh, I believe, with, uh, gosh, with uh, Carnegie Mellon. Uh, Carnegie Mellon is another great resource. We've partnered with them. Uh, so just, you know, I would emphasize looking at the cybersecurity framework, uh, also looking at the special publications, 853 version 4. Also, I believe it is 839, that is the risk management framework. Those are great, great starting points. Uh, if you're really, really interested in, in diving into uh, 
both from a risk management standpoint as well as from a cybersecurity standpoint, those are good starting points for, for the average uh, industry leader. Excellent. Ron, I think we're just about out of time, about 30 minutes ago, but that's great. <laughs> uh, we had that audio delay before. Again, Ron, thank you so much for your time, your wisdom, and your experience. And uh, again, thank you for your service uh, to our country here. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Bradford. Thanks you got for having it. Stay me. healthy and stay safe, and we'll see you again. Thanks to you as well. All right. And to all the people that are still with us, um, our next uh, power hour uh, in the New York region is going to be the 23rd of July. But the next power hour itself is going to be on the 16th of June. Uh, details are on cybersummitusa.com. Uh, we're going to begin instead of the Secret Service, we're going to actually kick off uh, the 16th of June with the FBI. And then we'll have experts uh, from Proofpoint, again from Checkpoint, and another expert from the DHS and CISA. Uh, in about six months from now, again, we will be returning to our live events all throughout the country. Uh, but until that time, we'll, we, we will be actually doing virtual events in all of the cities uh, across the country that uh, are on our website at CyberSummitUSA.com. Again, the slides will be available on that website. Uh, for those of you, and most of you have uh, joined us for the entire time, you'll be getting a CPE certificate. Uh, via email in a few days as well. And um, a video of this entire uh, broadcast will also be on our website if you did miss anything. Um, we do appreciate your time. Hopefully you've uh, gotten some good information from this, uh, from this webcast and we look forward of course to seeing you guys again. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, we will see you uh, on June 16th if you decide to join us for that fresh new look on what is happening today during uh, all of the unpredictable events uh, that are happening on a daily basis. So from all of us from the Cybersecurity Summit, thank you again for joining us. Take care. We created IoT Nation to help professionals like you navigate the IoT space to find the companies, people, use cases, and events that are most relevant for you. On IoT Nation, you can browse over 25,000 IoT-related companies and dive into the details for specific ones. You can also search geographically, zoom into any area of the map, and explore companies in any city. You can find applications in various verticals, such as smart buildings, smart cities, connected mobility, and many more. And you can plan your week and month ahead by searching dozens of online and offline events to find the ones that are most relevant for you. For all Cyber Summit Power Hour attendees, we are offering free use of IoT Nation Pro for 30 days with the code Cyber2020V. If you have any questions, contact us at info at IoTNation.com.